Um, my name is Jamie Hazlett, and I'm the Outreach Librarian here at Hannon Library, and this is the first faculty pub night of spring semester, and I'm delighted that you guys came out uh, to join us. Um, we have a lot of things going on this semester. Um, we've got the series of pub nights as well as this Manifold Greatness exhibition that's taking place out here. If you're interested in just being kept abreast of these sorts of programs and lectures and exhibits that we have going on, I do want to encourage you um, to sign up for our mailing list, which you can do um, over here. That's the end of the business. Um, so tonight's featured um, faculty author is Dr. Saba Sumik. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> so Dr. Sumik was born in Tehran, Iran, to a Persian Jewish family who moved <coughs> to Los Angeles to escape the Islamic Revolution of Iran. She received her bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley, her master's degree in theological studies from Harvard Divinity School, and her PhD in religious studies at UC Santa Barbara. She's an adjunct professor in theological studies here at LMU, an executive board member of the Jewish Studies Advisory Board, um, a frequent discussion leader at the library's Sunday Jewish Book Group, and curator of an exhibition currently on display that away at the Fowler Museum at UCLA called Light and Shadows, um, the story of Iranian Jews. So tonight, along with Dr. Holly Levitsky, the director of the Jewish Studies Program at LMU, um, Dr. Simek will be discussing her first book, <coughs> From the Shahs to Los Angeles, Three Generations of Iranian Jewish Women Between Religion and Culture, which was published in 2012 by State University of New York Press. So please join me in welcoming Holly and Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Saba, tell us about your book. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Thank you Jamie, thank you Holly, thank you Rhonda. Um, it's such a pleasure to see everyone out there, all of my good friends. So my book is about three generations of Iranian Jewish women. I grew up in Los Angeles and I was born in Iran. And I don't have the privilege of going back to Iran. Unfortunately, as being a Jew, well, the joke is you could go, but you won't come back. Um, and so I was always interested growing up with 48 first cousins, um, lots of aunts, and being in the community, I always looked to the women, because that's where all the little girls would hang out in the kitchens with their moms and their aunts and the grandmothers. And when your grandmother has, gets married at 12 and her first child is at 14, you basically have five generations of women in the kitchen. And there's lots of great stories, um, but I was too young to really appreciate them. And I spent a lot of time studying women in the Middle East. A part of my research was feminist anthropology when I was at Santa Barbara. And what I found was looking at women from Iran, the narrative was always very anti-Shah, which I knew that was not at all the narrative that I grew up under because if anything, Iranian Jews romanticized the Shah to an extreme level. They hate Carter. Everything was Carter's fault and the Shah was amazing. <laughs> um, and, but everything I was reading written by Iranian secular Muslim feminists was very anti-Shah and everything was about Muslim women. <clears throat> there was nothing written about women from other religious traditions in Iran, other religious minorities such as Christians, Jews, or Austrians. And so while I initially thought, okay, I want to do research, my, this was my PhD dissertation, I wanted to look at the Vedas and the Torah, I said, forget about that. I want to interview and I want to do an ethnographic portrait of Iranian Jewish women. I want to talk about women in the diaspora and talk about what it is like for them living in Iran and now what it's like for them living <coughs> in Los Angeles, which has the largest Iranian community in the world, expat community, <coughs> and the largest Iranian Jewish community. There's about 25,000 Jews left in Iran. Um, and there's about 50,000 Iranian Jews who live in Los Angeles. So this is the largest community, and it's really changed the landscape of Los Angeles and especially the American Jewish community in Los Angeles that has been established here for a very long time. So I interviewed 120 women from ages 90 to 18. And I put them into three categories, what I refer to as grandmother, mother, and daughter generation. The grandmother generation grew up under Reza Shah and Mohammad Reza Shah. And this was a time in Iran where religious minorities were able to come out of the Jewish ghettos, the Christian ghettos, and be a part of everyday secular Iranian society. I write in my book that this was the enlightenment, this was the Haskalah for Iranian Jews. All of a sudden they were able to come out of the Jewish ghettos, which they lived in from the 16th century Shia Islam up until 1925 when Reza Shah came into power. And they were allowed to assimilate and acculturate into secular society. What I did with these women was I wanted to ask them about their religious life. 
how were these group of women, the grandmother's generation, who got married at 12 or 13 years old to arrange marriages, and at 12 or 13 years old, you can imagine, you, don't, you have no idea who this man is, and then you have to move in with his family um, and all of his uncles and everyone like that, and you basically became a ma maidservant for that family. There was a pecking order, so your life <coughs> was good if your husband was good to you, but more importantly, if your mother-in-law was good to you. Because this woman got married at 11 or 12 years old, really doesn't have a relationship with her husband, so her real love of her life are her sons. And so for her, her sons became, we have this joke in Farsi that you know, the sons are, they, everything's served on a silver platter. <laughs> and because of the relationship that she should have with her husband, she actually, Daniel, you could attest to that, she should have <laughs> with, <laughs> she, the relationship she, he's my cousin, so I could say that. The relationship he has, with, she should have with her husband, she actually has that love affair with her son. And so the daughter-in-law coming in basically became a pecking order. So if your mother-in-law and her sister, your husband's sisters were good to you, then your life was okay. So I wanted to ask these women, well, what was life like, number one, from a religious perspective? These women did not know Jewish law, halakha. They were not able to read Hebrew. They were excluded from a very <coughs> male synagogue life. But they were still very religious. So how were they able to be religious? And we call this in sociology basically domestication of religion. For them, it was taking care of the house, keeping kosher. As you know, there's lots of holidays in Judaism and lots of rules revolving around that. They don't know all the correct rules they had to follow, so instead they would exaggerate this. For example, taking three months to prepare for Passover, repainting the house, restuffing your pillows. And when I would say to them, well, you know, according to Jewish law, there's nothing that says in the Torah or in the Talmud you have to restuff your pillow. No, 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 of course it does. Really where? I know it does. So for these women, this was the way, it was through the domestic sphere. And most importantly also, it was to ward the evil eye away from their family. It was a very big, and it still is in the Middle East, in any culture in the Middle East, Jewish, Christian, Muslims, or Austrian, the evil eye is a real entity. And a mother's duty was to keep that away from your children. And there are lots of religious rituals that women do and participate in, whether it's going to the Esther Mordechai tomb in Hamadan, the biblical town of Shushan, or lighting incense and doing these very intense prayers every night to ward off the evil eye to protect your children. So that was the first generation. And what was so interesting is I would call these women and I would say to them, can I just call, and I'd, this was all in Farsi, can I just come over and interview you? And they would say, oh, I have nothing to talk about. I have nothing to say. It's too bad my husband isn't alive. They're not used to anyone asking them anything about their life. And I said, okay, well, let me just come over, and let me just meet you, and let me just talk to you. Okay. And I go there, and, you know, they have the red lipstick on. Their hair was done because they're so excited that someone was coming into their house. And they had all of this food out for me. And, again, I have nothing to say. <coughs> Three hours later, they're talking my head off, and I can't get out of this apartment. Because once you start asking questions, they have so much to say. And the most interesting thing for me is I went in there asking about religion, and they ended up wanting to talk a lot about sexuality. You don't go asking 90-year-old per Persian woman about sexuality unless they bring it up. It was not at all anything that I was looking into. But their husbands have passed away. All of their in-laws have passed away. So now they have the opportunity to really talk and to really talk about what it was like at their age to have to go to the public bath, the hammams, and have their in-laws have to, all the women in the family, look at their bodies to make sure there wasn't any deformity before they could get married. All of these things, what was it like to have to show their virginity cloth the night of their wedding? I mean, you don't, I didn't ask about that. All of this came up. You know, of course, they showed me their wedding dresses and the ones who were able to escape Iran with it. And their little girl's dress. They were 12, 13 years old. So really, my interest was, tell me about your life. And tell me about all the religious things that you did. Tell me about your relationship with your husband, your in-laws, your children. And I just began to write all of that down. And then ironically, it was their grandchildren who would call me and say, can I have your transcripts? I don't know anything about my grandmother's life. I had no idea. You know, we would love to read this. Can you send it to me? So in that way, I felt like I was able to sit down and write these women's stories and finally get it 
a Jewish Iranian perspective on life. And that was just the grandmother's generation. I had the mother's generation, these women who were raised under Mohammad Reza Shah. For those who aren't familiar with Iranian history, Mohammad Reza Shah came into power in 1945 when he was 21 years old. And his, he based himself, like his father, on Mohammad Ataturk of Turkey. All he wanted to do was bring secularization and modernization to Iran. And so the Jews became, in a sense, the nouveau riche, and they ate it up. They loved anything that was associated with Europe, being secular. I mean, they were still religious at home, but in the outside world, they wanted to be secular. <coughs> So these are the women, like my mom's generation, who grew up going to Tehran University. My mom, very luckily, we escaped Iran, and she was working at the American Embassy two weeks before it was taken over. So they, these women saw themselves as being very independent, and, but then they had to come here. So my question to them was, well, what is your religiosity like now? What was life like for you then? And what is life like for you now? And for these women, a lot of them didn't grow up studying Judaism. They went to Jewish day schools, but in Iran, the Jewish day schools were more interested in teaching you French, because that was what was more popular than teaching you anything about Hebrew or Judaism. And so these women came here, and what I found is a lot of them are highly involved in the conservative and reform movements in Los Angeles. You go to so many Ashkenazi, Eastern European synagogues, such as Sinai Temple, which is 100 years old, established by German Jews, and the whole congregation is mostly Iranian Jews. A fascinating phenomenon. Um, and a lot of them came here, studied Hebrew, got bat mitzvahed in their 40s, their 50s, a part of the sisterhood. But there's also a whole new movement that had become what we refer to as ba'alot shuva, or religious Jews. And they're embracing Orthodox, ultra Orthodox, and even Hasidic Judaism. And if you just drive around Pico Robertson, you see now the new. Iranian Jewish Hasidic Jewish community or Orthodox community, and none of that ever existed in Iran either. To see an Iranian Jew dressed like a Chabadnik uh, from Lubavitch, Russia, makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> Nevertheless, one of the more popular synagogues on, P on Pico is Iranian Chabad, which is a really interesting thing. And then finally, I interviewed women, college girls, from 18 to about 30, the ones who were raised in Los Angeles. And my big thing with them was, how do you identify yourself? What's, you know, what they refer to you as, are you Persian, are you American, are you Jewish? And really talking to them about the first generational angst that they deal with. And it's not just Iranian Jewish girls, it's I think any immigrant community who have parents coming from a very traditional society and then you're coming to America in Los Angeles and these girls want independence but they're, they have a reputation they have to uphold and the amount of gossip and wanting to pursue this, but parents wanting them to get married, and how do they define their hybrid identity? So that's a very long answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you answered all my questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about um, the nature of, uh, if you say it's a very secret society, very closed society, and there's a lot of gossip within the community itself. Um, did it help or hinder you going into that those situations, being an Iranian Jew and being a member of, of that society? That's a great question. I, has anyone ever read Samuel Hyman's book um, on gossip in the synagogues? Gossip really, there's, a, there's a function of gossip in a synagogue. And most synagogues, whether Iranian, Jewish, Sephardic, or Ashkenazic, there's a lot of gossip. The Iranian Jewish community, ha it, it functions on gossip, and it functions on reputation. <laughs> And you can't meet someone without your parents saying, oh, my cousin is your cousin, so they're actually related to you. And everyone knows each other's business. And when you're looking at a minority, so that's just true with Iranians. And then when you're looking at a minority community where even they were relegated to living in the Jewish ghetto, so everyone knew each other's business, and then you come out of the ghettos, and the, even though you were allowed to be emancipated under the Shah, the Jews still lived with each other, just now in more affluent communities. Everyone's rep everyone knows whatever's going on in each other's lives. And so it was really hard to get women to open up to me because they were so worried that people were gonna recognize them and find out about their life. Now the women who didn't care were the older generation, the grandmother generation. Because <laughs> I changed everyone's name in my book and they could care less. They're like, who's gonna touch me? I'm a widow, I'm, I'm now the matriarch. I'm now my, you know, my mother-in-law. So they could care less. The mother's generation had a harder time with it too because you know, I think for a lot of them, immigration for them was so difficult. And I took it for granted too growing up with my mom 
who worked full-time, was a full-time mother also as soon as she came home. And for a lot of these women, especially because in Middle Eastern culture, going to a therapist or something is so taboo, because who's going, if anyone finds out, no one will marry your daughter because they think their mother's crazy or something. <laughs> so it's not a culture that believes in therapy or anything. So a lot of times I ask these women questions, and they would just break down and start hysterically crying. And I'd have to turn off my, my tape recorder, go hug them, tell them it's <laughs> I mean, you could tell there was just so much going on, and they kept saying, please make sure you don't use my name. I don't want to ruin my daughter's reputation. I don't want to you know, ruin my family's reputation. It was a younger <laughs> generation that completely had a hard time trusting me, or really just opening up, because they're the ones who are st still trying to find their spouses. And so much of their life is based on gossip and reputation and making sure that they're not involved in any of that. So those girls were the ones who kept saying, I, maybe uh, 10 times in an interview, you swear you're going to change my name? It's like, of course I'm going to change your name. We changed my profession, changed my age, so no one could even figure out if a 30-year-old school teacher is me or something like that. So they're the ones who had a really hard time. Now, the reason why I was able to get all of these women to open up to me is because I had the insider and the outsider perspective. I am an Iranian Jewish girl. I knew the questions to ask. I wasn't someone coming in from the outside who was being critical of the community. If I was being critical, it was because I knew the community. But yet, at the same time, I'm an Iranian Jewish girl who basically left the community um, and came back 10 years later, but isn't really socially a part of it. So in that way, people felt like they could open up to me, but not worry if they're going to see me at a party and I'm going to know all of their secrets or anything like that. So I was in a good position to be both on the inside and the outside. OK, so maybe we can go back to the grandmother generation. Yeah and talk a little bit about how that generation and immigrating to the U.S., how that might have altered their <coughs> religiosity and their relationship to Judaism. Okay, great. So these women, as I mentioned, didn't know anything about halakha, Jewish law. So they had everything that they learned came to them from their mothers, their grandmothers. So a lot of it was based on not factual Judaism, but okay, we're going to light four candles during the Sabbath because I have four children. Or, as I mentioned, we're going to, of course you have to, and my, my grandmother would still do this, sl slaughter an animal and let the blood drip during Yom Kippur. No, you really don't do this anymore. No, 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 of course we still do it. And all of these rules and regulations, which really made them just stick to the house, and they couldn't come out of the house. When they would tell me about just the Passover traditions that they had to do. A kosher for Passover food didn't exist then. So what do these women have to do? Take blocks of salt and grind it and make a kosher for Passover. Take every single plate and every single spoon and put it in boiling water um, because they didn't, they couldn't afford to get new plates. Uh, rice, Sephardic Jews could eat rice during Passover, Ashkenazi Jews cannot. They would go through every little grain of rice to make sure that there's not a single pebble in there. So girls were taken out of school by their mothers to start preparing for Passover two or three months in advance. So it hindered their education, and then this is what the mothers would be doing, and the grandmothers. And in conjunction with that, Passover always fell during the Persian New Year of eight. And the Persian New Year always falls in March or April. And the Persian Jews under Shia Islam were considered to be what's referred to as najes, impure. So Jews and Christians were placed in the same category for, um, as dogs, pigs, feces, etc. So she has looked at them as being impure. As a Jew, you weren't allowed to touch the food. You weren't allowed to walk out in the rain because if the water touched your body and then got into a Muslim water system, it would make them impure. Um, there was lots of rules and regulations they had to follow. You can drink from the same drinking fountain, or you had to wear clothes that specifically said Jehud, a very derogatory way of saying Jewish, so people knew not to have any physical contact with you to not make them impure. So what a lot of these women would say is the reason why they would go to such an extreme to clean their house and purify their house during Passover was to show to their Muslim neighbors, you think we're impure, you think we're na najes, impure, but look at how clean our house is. Look at the way we take care of our house. Look at how we uphold the rules of keeping kosher. So it was one way of having that numinous relationship with God, and it was another way to show their religious Muslim neighbors you think we're impure, but we're not, because look at how clean we are. And then these women come to America, specifically to Los Angeles. They start going to reform and conservative synagogues. 
And then they realized, wait a minute, I didn't have to do any of that. There was no reason for any of that. There's nothing in Jewish law that says, I have to do this. And of course, old age also makes it impossible to do this type of backbending work. So what you do see is a whole new relationship that they have now with embracing going to synagogue. And these women don't drive, they're so old. But what they will do is they will take the, I mean, they know how to navigate the bus system in Los Angeles. It's amazing. <coughs> but most of them don't speak English well at all. They'll get on the bus. To, an hour later, they'll end up at Sinai Temple or Stephen S. Wise or Nessa or anything and go to synagogue. And when I ask them, well, why do you choose to go to an Ashkenazi synagogue? We love Rabbi Wolfie. Rabbi Wolfie is the rabbi at Sinai Temple, for example. Do you understand anything he's saying? No, not at all. I have no idea what's coming out. <laughs> but they just love him. They also said one of the main things that they love is the egalitarian movement. That in the reform and conservative movements, they see girls going up and getting bat mitzvahed. And they said, we never had that opportunity. So for us, it's so important to see our daughters go out there and have that opportunity. And even one of the girl, women said, even if it's not my daughter or granddaughter, it, I feel like she's my granddaughter because I take so much pride in a woman being able to be bat mitzvahed. And I take so much pride in a female rabbi because they never had any of that. And so for them, this is so much about embracing American Judaism as being able to embrace these movements. much. Um, can you talk a little bit about the mother generation and what it was like to grow up um, in Iran as a Jewish woman, say from the 1950s to the 1970s? Right, okay. So these women grew up under Mohammad Reza Shah. They grew up idolizing his wife, Fada. Did anyone see the movie Argo? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Argo did a good job I, depicting what the revolution was like. And it did, they did a, he did, Ben Affleck did a good job explaining what it was like for the Shah and his wife. He didn't, she didn't literally <coughs> bathe in milk, as he explained, but they did live a very gluttonous life. And when you looked at Iranian Jews who are now becoming the new elite, the new rich community in Iran, they loved it, they emulated it, they wanted to be a part of that because they were told for so long, you're nothing, and now they come out and they see this and they could afford, at least in their own minds, to have this lifestyle. So for a lot of these Iranian Jewish women, like my own mom, they grew up at a Jewish day school, where, as I mentioned, a very well-known Jewish day school in Tehran, in northern Tehran, and it was so well-known that secular Muslims would send their children there because the education was so good. But being able to be in a Jewish day school gave my mom a lot more freedom than girls who were not, Iranian Jewish girls who were not placed in a Jewish day school, because the biggest fear for parents, which is similar to what immigrant parents deal with now, is this independence, is oh my gosh, my Jewish daughter is now in school with a Muslim, and what if she marries him? Because, as everyone would say to me, if you married a Muslim, you were dead in our family. No one was allowed to do that. So even though on the outside, everyone wanted to be secular, no one wanted to be identified by being a Jew, in the inside, they still maintained their traditional Shabbat dinners, keeping kosher in the house, and the biggest fear was that people were going to, women were going to marry non-Jewish men and leave the Iranian Jewish community. So it's still a very insular community, even though all of these women have these opportunities. But they had these opportunities and they went to school and they, the thing was, you had to get married at, in your early 20s or else you were considered, in Farsi it's called going sour or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of these women, it's go to school, even go to Tehran University, because under the Shah, women for the first time were able to go to the university school system. But they were really not allowed to do anything with that. If you worked as a woman, it looked really bad for your husband and your family because the understanding was, oh look, they're having financial problems if the daughter's working, or the wife's working, or the daughter's working. So it was very hard for these women to be both on the inside and outside of both cultures. What was life like for, again, the mother's generation in Iran with the non-Jewish community? You know, my mom would say all the time that they had so many, it became, if you had a lot of Muslim friends, it was considered, wow, you were really, um, uh, there's a Persian word, Roshan Fek, and you're really modern and you're so cool because you have Muslim friends. If you had only Jewish friends, you were considered to be kind of that ghetto Jew back in the ghettos of Iran. So it became really popular to have Muslim friends, to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> Um, but they would still say there was always that layer of anti-Semitism, you know, and I'm, with my exhibition I give lots of tours and we have a whole wall looking at um, 
in Jews in Iran now and how that concept of being impure has come back with Khomeini. And I always say, it wasn't as if Khomeini showed up one day and it was there. It's, not, it's like the Holocaust. It wasn't as if Hitler showed up and then all of a sudden anti-Semitism came back. That anti-Semitism was always there. And if you lived in Tehran and you were part of the new upper middle class, you didn't want to show it because it made you look really backwards. But nevertheless, they felt it all the time. So my mom would say, we always knew that there was a difference because there were all those little comments that they would make where they didn't realize, oh, you're being such a Jew, you know, because, or something like that. And even at my mom's Jewish day school, all, everyone who worked there, um, all the janitors, for example, came from the lower socioeconomic status. They were all the ones from the villages that the Shah brought into Tehran to build all of his new high rises. And my mom would say even the janitors would not touch our food because they were, they were such religious Muslims that they always thought of us as still being najas, impure. So that never went away. It was always there. And the people who still believe it are still there. And the ones who didn't escaped with all the Jews and everyone else from Iran because they knew that this was what Khomeini is going to bring back, that type of mentality. Can you talk a little bit about what constitutes a good Jewish woman, again, from, from that generation, and perhaps the social responsibilities and expectations right. of them? Right, okay, so the grandmother's generation, what made a good Jewish woman, literally being on your hands and knees and cleaning the house, and then going to the Esther Mordechai tomb, and then literally sacrificing a goat in your, your mm -hmm. front lawn. I mean, these women would say, I have like, blood on me, I'm, you know, it's... So that was what became a good Jewish woman, was that self-sacrificing, altruistic woman. By my mother's generation, you're living under the Shah, everyone wanted to live European and regal, so you had to be beautiful. This was a generation where everyone got a nose job. Everyone got a nose job. Um, having a nose job meant that you were wealthy in Iran. <coughs> Till this day, actually, I don't know if you guys are know this, but Iran is the capital of, rhino, of nose jobs. <laughs> because, I mean, and I, I think this is so interesting, because you're looking at a community where the women are only wearing a chador, so they're covering their face. So what's, what do they do? They get a nose job to make their nose look less Semitic, in a sense. And in Iran <coughs> now, women who don't get nose jobs pretend like they do and they keep the bandages on So because it's become a social status thing. So over here, if you get a nose job, like half of my high school growing up in Beverly Hills, no one shows up for two weeks and then they show up with a different nose. Over there, right after the operation, everyone's running around because everyone is that social status. And it was like that for my mom's generation. That's the generation where everyone started getting nose jobs, started to look European. And what constituted a good Jewish wife is this Persian word referred to as Najib. Najib literally means to be a virgin and also pure in every way, to kind of be this wide-eyed girl where you don't know anything and you just wait for your husband to teach that to you. So a girl always had to be Najib. If there was any belief that she wasn't Najib and pure, whether sexually or if she knew too much, then the mother-in-law would get involved and say, you can't marry her. And the, the, the son would have to listen. And so you always had to have this level of purity, and you had to be educated, but not too educated, because then the men would find that intimidating. Um, and also what it became was a social aspect, and even in Los Angeles now, has anyone ever been to a Persian wedding or a bar bat mitzvah? Mm -hmm. Persian weddings now have anywhere, Persian Jewish, I'm not familiar with non-Jewish, 600, 700 people at a bar bat mitzvah, weddings, 800 people. And it's a small community, but you have to invite everyone and their mother and their father and their, because you have to pay them back. And this is the way you really show who you are in the community by how big of a lavish of a party you could throw. And that's what became Vogue, and that's what constituted a good Jewish wife was all the social aspects she had to be a part of. And there's also this thing called Dore, which are um, women's get-togethers. And you had, and you got into the right. I mean, it's a, almost like a Jane Austen novel. If you got into the right social get-together, what you're doing is you're building that relationship with other mothers, so that her son will then come courting your daughter. And this is my mom's generation, and this is now too. So it hasn't changed that much. And these women would always say, "We were the ones who were pure, and all the Muslim girls were the ones who were sleeping around." And then I interviewed Muslim women, not religious Muslims, but secular Muslim women, and I said. Is this true? They go, absolutely not. We have to be pure, too. I mean, you think anyone talked about sex, they knew we were having sex and they weren't having sex. But the idea was that the other was always more sexually progressive than we were. <laughs> we were never allowed to show our sexuality. 
Um, so you discussed how Jewish practices have changed for uh, Iranian women once they moved to Los Angeles. And I wonder, you talked a little bit about the synagogue practice and so on. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about how those practices have changed? Yeah, so what we see is now there's a, an appropriation of Ashkenazi rituals and traditions. So before it used to be the grandfather, the eldest man in the house would be saying a prayer over the challah. The women didn't know any of this, so barely even saying a prayer over the candles or anything. But then what happens is this generation comes here and starts learning, going to Ashkenazi synagogue, starts taking classes at the University of Judaism, currently called the AJU, like my mom, learning Hebrew, learning what you were really supposed to do because they weren't taught any of that. And then all of a sudden, now what you see is that the women are really leading a lot of those um, prayers or even the younger generation because the most important thing for a lot of Iranian Jews was to send their children to Jewish day schools. And then they became, began to learn vicariously through their children. So it is my little nieces and nephews, and it was me who would say the prayer, my sister and I, and it wasn't my dad. My dad was an he didn't learn any of this growing up in Iran. Um, and what are the melodies that we're singing is most of these Ashkenazi melodies, because that's the ones we've been taught, and that's what now everyone's appropriating. So you're seeing this mix of very traditional Ashkenazi tunes and traditions with um, Iranian Jewish traditions. And it really is such a great understanding of looking at Jewish life in Los Angeles, because really only in Los Angeles do you really see this, or really only in America. You talked about some of the challenges with the grandmother generation, um, mainly getting out of there right. <laughs> after after they wanted to talk more and more and more right. and more. I wonder, were there different kinds of different sets of challenges with the mother generation? And did you interview your own mother and your own relatives? I absolutely did. I think with the mother's generation, there was so much. It breaks my heart. There was so much sadness. They so overly romanticized their life in Iran and the time under the Shah. And one woman told me. We were living in a cloud. We didn't realize there was anti-Semitism. We didn't even see the revolution coming. I said, well, how did you not see the revolution coming? But you have to remember, this is under a dictatorship that they loved. And there was one television channel. Everything else was European movies. So that's what they grew up with. Um, and it was one news channel that was dictated by the Shah. The CIA didn't even tell Carter the revolution was happening. So my mom was like, well, how was I supposed to see it if the CIA didn't even see it? Um, so for them, this was a time where life was easy. So many people, I think there's this belief that all Iranian Jews came here with so much money. Some people did. Most of the community did not. They, we had to escape with whatever. I mean, I don't even have my birth certificate. I have no idea what day I was really born. Because it was a Muslim calendar, a lunar. I mean, so I have no idea. You came with whatever you could bring. It might have been three Persian carpets, whatever jewelry you had. But, you know, I know for us personally, we lost all of our land. We lost my dad's business. We lost our home. With that, we lost pictures. I have no idea what my mom's wedding dress. I mean, all these little things that you think just make up someone's memory. And we had to build a new one in Los Angeles. So there's a lot of sadness I see with this generation of women, understandably, because to have to relearn a whole new language, and a lot of these women then had to work in Los Angeles because <coughs> they left everything behind. So here they think they're marrying a husband. Remember, marriage meant a different, there is no concept of love the way we understand love. It's more about compatibility and what's good on paper. And so here you're marrying someone because you think you're going to live this good life because he's affluent and can take care of you, and then you lose everything. And now you're working on 9th Street in Santee in downtown selling fabric. And then you come home, but the difference is Persian men, not all of them, but Persian men didn't say, well, you're working with me all day, so let me help you in the kitchen. It's, okay, and now you go and do the duties you have to do as a wife. And so for that, it was really, really hard for them. And so many of the women who did work felt so guilty, not because they worked, but because they didn't attend all the female social functions to make that connection with other mothers to then establish their sons coming to court their daughters. So that was where it was like, I, I, I did a disservice to my daughters because I wasn't social in the way I had to be in order to have her have all these courtships and all these people coming to get her and stuff. Oh. And yeah. I wonder if you can talk about that same question, the, the most challenging part of interviewing the first generation, uh, the generation that I assume you consider yourself part of. Right, so that generation, it's hard, and I'm sure if anyone is a daughter of immigrant parents, it's you, you have the same you know, hardship. I didn't have any 
text to look at in regards to Iranian Jewish women. There was nothing out there. So, which I think is the reason why my book got published so quickly, was there was a dearth of material. So I had to look at other religious communities and ethnic communities. And it was all <coughs> the same, whether you're South Asian, whether you're Latina, um, East Asian, that concept of wanting that independence but not being able to get it and still wanting to respect your parents, especially your mom. And what I found also is there was so much pressure on these girls. Um, you have to get, you have to go to UCLA. You have to be smart. But then once you get married, you basically have to let go of that, just like your mom's generation. So w what am I supposed to be? And what if I don't want to be a doctor? Well, I mean, because girls in our community are doctors, lawyers, realtors, pharmacists. But what if I want to be an actress? What if I want, you know, anything that's considered you know, not the traditional path is considered very negative. I mean, my sister's an actress, for example. And in traditional Persian culture, you don't want your daughter to be an actress. It wasn't considered a good thing. You, you know, it's, and people would say to my mom, how are you letting her do this? She might as well be a belly dancer, you know, which is equivalent to being a stripper, basically. <laughs> Even though you bring belly dancers to bar and bat mitzvah, so it's a weird concept. Um, so how are you letting your your daughter your daughter do this? My sister was married is married and was just married at that time. So it wasn't even talking to my sister about it. People would go straight to her husband. How are you letting her do this? Now my brother in law is American. So this was such a he's like, what do you, I have no say in this? I totally support her. Why would I not let her do this? Or and so the community was very unencouraging of her. And then she was in this great movie called Crash that ends up going to the Academy Awards and she's at the Academy Awards and. People Magazine takes a picture of her in this beautiful Calvin Klein dress that was blown up, and the next thing we know, everyone in the community, oh, we always were so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? And because every, all of a sudden, she showed that she could be successful in this weird profession that everyone thought was such an awful thing. And so it was really hard to be able to pave your own way and still have to respect your parents and want to show them, like, I don't, I'm not here to ruin your reputation, but at one point, I need to live my own life. Also, boys and girls have very different standards in our community very different standards. The boys are allowed to go away to school, the girls are not. The irony is that the girls are the ones who want to go and the boys stay. <laughs> Why do they stay? As a lot of their brothers would tell me, well, my mom does my laundry, I, everything's taken care of for me. And the boys have the luxury of coming home with women and the parents turn around and don't say anything. Um, and the girls don't have that opportunity at all. So there's a lot of that misogyny and inequality that takes place. It's not go and be a lawyer, it's go and marry a lawyer. But if you do be a lawyer, that's great, except that you know that you, we want you to stop practicing law once you get married to have children. And so that part was really hard. On the other extreme, what you're finding with the Iranian Jewish community, just like you find with the mother's generation, is a lot of them are becoming religiously orthodox. And they are embracing what I refer to, what's called Ba'adot Shuvah. They're embracing a very religious form of Judaism that their parents, what, from their parents' perspective, is too religious. And I mean, this is the same situation you see with Ashkenazi families too. But even within the Iranian Jewish community, your parents have the ultimate say in your life and the final say in your life. So to think that a rabbi has more of a say than your father or your mother is incredibly insulting and very threatening. So what is the most important weekday of the night for us? Shabbat. Whether or not Iranian Jews halakhically practice Shabbat correctly, Everyone has to be together for the Sabbath dinner. I mean, my cousins then go off, my younger cousins to bars and clubs, but you're together for the Sabbath dinner. So for a daughter to turn to her mom and say, Mom, I'm not going because I can't walk there and I'm not going to get in the car, is really <coughs> threatening to familial life. Or the biggest fear is you're going to marry a black hat, someone who's very religious, you're going to have children, and your children won't eat in our house because we have no concept of what it means to separate plates, and even the concept of black kosher, that didn't exist in Iran. So this is a really new thing that the Iranian Jewish community is dealing with, are those girls who are becoming more religious. What do parents always say to me, because I used to teach at UCLA, a course on Iranian Jewish history, she wants to go to Israel, but tell her to go on birthright and not on Aisha Torah. Aisha Torah is an Orthodox Jewish synagogue that sends people to Israel. Why? Because they know these girls come back more religious. So for the parents, it's go on a secular program, not on a religious program. I had one girl say to me, who's about, um, who became more religious, and she's Shomer Nagia, she doesn't touch men who are not her immediate family members. And she said, you know, when I was younger, meaning 18, 
because she was 20. I used to go to clubs and bars, and my dad would yell at me, your, your skirt is too short, your skirt is too short. And now that I wear these really long <laughs> skirts, he yells at me, put on that mini skirt, put on that <laughs> mini skirt. And so they go, when are they going to be happy? Let us just live our life. And I think that's the hardest part. You talk about the struggles they have with gender inequality, um, with autonomy over their uh, professional interests and uh, potential partners and so on. What's life like with their mother? Okay, great question too. What you find is the mothers have played, because there's so much, I don't want to say people don't have a good life, but there's, you know, you, you're marrying someone because your parents told you to marry <coughs> them. So you're not, and a lot of times these women, their husbands are 13, 10, 15 years older than them. And that begins to hit once you hit your 40s and 50s and you realize, and then <coughs> your kids start going to college. And one of the main reasons why Iranian Jewish parents don't allow their children to go away to school is a lot of the parent, children told me, my mom gave me this example that we're, we're like a scissor. Your father and I are stuck together with this little screw, and you are the screw. So if you leave us, that screw is going to, you know, our marriage is going to dissipate. And that's a lot of pressure to put on someone who's young, is that you have to, you have to be the reason why your family is still together. And by the way, divorce is so taboo because if you get divorced, someone's not going to want to marry your son or your daughter because they come from a divorced family. And so there's so much pressure placed on the girls in that way. Also, as I mentioned, Going to see a therapist is so taboo. And Persians, there's, everyone lives a very secretive life. So very few women even open up to their own, but they don't open up to their friends because you have to act like everything's perfect. They, very few of them even open up to their own daughter, I mean, to their sisters or anything like that. So who, in a sense, becomes the therapist of these women? Their daughters. And that, again, is a lot of pressure. So I had girls tell me from the age of six, seven, all I would hear is my mom complain about my dad about her in-laws, how she hasn't been respected by the in-laws because she came from not as a wealthy family, or she would divorce my parent, her, my husband, my, her dad, my dad, if it wasn't because of me, and because she's trying to, do, you know, make sure I get married off, and so they become therapists, and that also is so much pressure. And so while I talk to the the mother generation and say, well, did you think you know it was okay for you to get married at such a young age? Would you? Yeah, I wish I pursued this. I wish I did that. Well, how old is your daughter? 24. She's going to get married soon. So I was like, oh, so she's kind of following your footsteps. And the whole idea is like, look, I know that what I, what, you know, she wants more freedom and I want to tell her to go live her own life, but I know that would ruin her reputation. And so as much as I want to give her that, because I love her so much, I need to keep her in line in order to make sure. So it's a lot of times it's the women who continue on without misogyny. And their understanding of it is I'm trying to uphold her reputation. Because reputation means everything in Middle Eastern culture. What's the relationship like between Iranian Jewish women and Ashkenazi Jewish women? Yeah, so I work with Mary Vitagosas and his Human Relations Committee, it's HRC, and we do a lot of interfaith work. And they came to me and they said, we want you to get the Iranian Jewish community and the Iranian Shia Muslim community get together, maybe they can meet at the Imam Reza Mosque or something, do you think they'll be interested in interfaith talk? And my response to them was, interfaith talk for Iranian Jews is actually talking to Ashkenazis right now. <laughs> like, it's, it's not even about Muslims, it's about talking to non-Iranian Jews. So the relationship has gone a lot better in Los Angeles because so many of these Iranian Jewish parents are sending their children to these schools where there's lots of American Ashkenazi Jews. But nevertheless, it's still really difficult because Jewish, Iranian Jewish kids want to only hang out and congregate with Iranian Jewish kids, whether they are at Beverly Hills High School, Stephen S. Wise, Grant High School. This is an issue that, for my interviews, all of the high schools said, or at, at the elementary school said, we have such a problem with this, that in Sinai Temple, they made a rule, you're not allowed to speak Farsi on school grounds. And the parents were really offended, and they thought this is you know, this is so biased, this is so unfair, you don't want your Persian people to be happy here. And the school's response is not that. Parents have been complaining that all the parents get together while they're waiting for their children and only speak Farsi, and the American parents feel really left out and excluded. Um, it's a very insular culture. In 
under the Shah, I mean, before the Shah, we lived in the Jewish ghettos. The Shah allowed us to come out, and then they formed their own Jewish ghettos in nicer areas. <coughs> and we still form those same Jewish ghettos. But now the irony is the ghettos are Beverly Hills, Brentwood, you know, affluent areas. But there still is that concept of just sticking together. When I taught at UCLA, 90% of my students were Iranian Jewish kids, college students. And they turned to me and they said, Professor Simo, how come you don't speak with a Persian accent? And I said, how do you speak with a Persian accent? You were born and raised here. It makes no sense to me. But for a lot of them, because they are so insular and they only hang out with each other, they've developed this way of talking and this Persian accent that sounds just like their grandparents. By the way, grandparents really help raise children, so they, but they didn't get out of that. Um, I could hear a Persian Jewish kid from a mile away. Immediately I hear the accent because you just hear the intonation and it's, it's fascinating that they're fascinated that I don't have one, and they who are 18 years old and raised in Los Angeles do. Alba, uh, what do you want your readers to walk away with after reading this book? Well, I think the most important thing is there's so much out there on Iran right now. Iran and its nuclear issues, Ahmadinejad denying the Holocaust, and wanting to wipe off Israel, and. I think one thing that's very important for me is for people to know, not only Iranian Jews to know their history, not only Ashkenazi Jews to know Iranian history, but for people to know that Jews existed in Iran, and it's one of the oldest Jewish communities that dates back 2,700 years ago to the Assyrian conquest in 722 BCE, that some of the greatest well-known people from the Hebrew scriptures, Esther, Mordecai, <coughs> the prophet Daniel, they are from the Persian Empire. I want people to know our culture. I want people to understand that we're not what you see on an awful show, you know, <laughs> that it's not all of that. And, you know, and I also want people to understand that there was always this traditional belief that women in the Middle East are dealing, you know, are so separated from religion and they're relegated to the domestic sphere and they don't have any power. And I really want the community, and not only the community, but people outside of the community to see how powerful these women are. And they, have created their own power within their own context. It might not be a westernized context, but it is their own context because like all religious traditions, all communities, all households, it really is the woman who keeps it together. And I really wanted to, in a sense, pay homage to these women, the ones I grew up with, and a lot of them who are passing away now. So I wanted to get their stories heard. Do you, are you uh, working on a new project? Do you hope to do more with um, this? population and this topic? I do. I'm going to be working with, um, UCLA has a grant, it's called Mapping uh, Jewish LA, and so I'm going to be working on mapping Iranian Jewish LA, so I'll be ha having some students who are going to write and be a part of the oral history of this community, and then when I was teaching my course at UCLA, um, it was a three-hour class once a week, and the beginning of it was Iranian Jewish history, and really Iranian history and then Jewish history. And then what I realized was, oh my gosh, this is like a therapy class, because here you have 90% of the students who are Iranian Jews, and it turned into the girls turning to the guys and saying, you expect us to be this, this, and that, and the guys saying, you expect us to graduate and be millionaires, and then you're going to marry us, and all of this. And then I had my Muslim secular students turn to the Jews and say, how come you guys won't hang out with us? How come you get excluded from everything? Why do you? Why are you so insular? Um, so there was a lot of that, but I had a couple of students who came up to me, very privately, Iranian Jewish boys, and said, because I've taught the course a couple of times, and they said to me, how about me? I'm gay. Where do I fit in in this community? Because I really cannot in any way. You think it's hard for a girl? Try being a gay man. And so I have to leave this community in order to not embarrass my family, but still live the life I want to live. And so I want my next book to be on um, really just the LGBT community in, in Los Angeles coming from Iran, not just Jews, Muslims too, because working at the Fowler, I've, a lot of people come up to me who are from that community, and when I talk to them about it, you know, they would say, where were you 10 years ago? We'd love to get our story heard. It's so hard for us. And so I, I would love to get people's voices heard who don't really have that opportunity while completely hiding their identity and promising them that I would. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a few minutes for yeah, questions. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, it's almost, um, it's five to seven right now, so I think there's probably time for 10, 15 minutes of questions. And um, I need to duck out, but I'll let you answer. And then I do want to encourage everybody to have another glass of wine. <laughs> Chat with Saba, buy a book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I'll start where you left off. Do you see evolution in the Iranian Jewish community in terms of LGBT issues? I hope so. I hope so. You know, people ask me, I was on a panel that they wanted to talk about Shah's uh, sunset. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like, really? I have to watch it so I, so I have to talk about it. And I, I mean, I watched the show. I was aghast by it. But there was this one episode where there is a gay Iranian <coughs> on the show whose dad, I guess, is Jewish and mother was not, and his family rejected him because his mother wasn't Jewish. And I hated to even admit it. I was like, oh, this isn't that. And then it became very bad. But I was, I, so I do think that it's out there a little bit more. And I think more, the more the community is in Los Angeles, the more they're going to begin to have to accept it. It's funny. When Ahmed Dijah went to Columbia University, and a student asked him at Columbia University, the president of Iran, talk to me about the fact that you're hanging men, you know? And he said, we didn't, we didn't kill those two 16-year-old boys because they were gay. We killed them for the, he gave some ridiculous reason. And he says, we don't have any gays in Iran, a country with 80 million people. <laughs> and everyone, exactly, everyone laughed at that. But that is the mentality of Persian parents. Oh, we don't have any of that, but of course you do. And then people all of a sudden go, where is your son? He left to New York, we haven't seen him in five years. And that's what people feel like they have to do in order to be able to live their life. And it's not fair that they have to escape their community in order, mm -hmm. why can't you have both? So I think it is, but you know, but I think it'll take a long time. Just women and their independence is beginning to happen. So we'll wait and see. I hope so. Do you think that those kind of TV shows, like that show The Sunset, do you think those come out because there was such a repressed sexual culture um, within Iranian Jews in LA? Do you think that that's why we have, you know, this sort of glitz and glamour and miniskirts sort of thing? Is because they were so that was such a taboo topic, and you got you said they couldn't talk about their sexuality? Yeah, no, I think absolutely, and I think that. <coughs> Growing up under the shot, anything that was wealthy, I can say, I've never been to a Persian Jewish home. It looks like, I mean, I, it looks like Versailles in there. It is so gold and gilded, and I mean, that's not Persian. And that was all introduced when the Shah came into power. Everything European. And so that whole concept of showing up, there's no concept of holding back. It's all it's supposed to be all out there. And the irony of that show is that the people who are on that show, and I went to high school with some of them, they're supposed to be the most affluent people in the community. We have no idea who they are. I mean, they're not, they don't have any money. So it's a lot. If you're going to do the most affluent people, do the Nazarians. The people like the Nazarians who fund every project, Iranian Jewish project in LA, would never be on a show like that. And so there's so much of that of just pretending like this is what Iranian Jews are. And it really has ruined, or Iranians, and it really has ruined our reputation. Because you could look at a show like Jersey Shore, which also is awful, but most people in America. Italian Americans have been here long enough that they can look at this and say, I know that Italian Americans are not like this. This is a subculture of a subculture of a subculture. But who in Wisconsin has a Persian friend? Yeah. So they look at this and go, oh, this is what it's all about, and this glitz and this glamour, and really just this awful mentality in the way they fight. I mean, it was disgusting just watching one episode. I, I couldn't watch it. I thought I had to take a shower afterwards. And, you know, um, I'm really hurt. I'm, I'm bummed it got picked up again. And what really bothers me is that Persians watch the show, you know? And so, so stop watching it. You're giving them ratings. But people are so curious to see how awful we're being depicted. Then it's and just stop watching it. Pastor, um, I, I'm, dumb, I'm surprised by you're saying that they, they're insular and that they want to stay together, yet they're going to Ashkenazi synagogues. And I've often wondered why. I mean, next to Sana Temple, Sephardic Temple, why? Why? Yeah. Why? Great question. Sana Temple and Sephardic Temple are two blocks away from each other. Right. A lot of Persians do go to Sephardic Temple. I think the reason why Sana became so popular was all of our parents came here. All of them wanted to give us a Jewish education. There was really, your, your two choices during that time period, the early 80s, was, at least in West Los Angeles, you had Sinai and then you had Yula, or you had uh, Bilal, S. and Stephen S. Wise. And so Stephen S. Wise became a little too reform, even though now a lot of people go there. Sinai is concerned. So everyone's just started, and it's smack in the middle of Westwood, as opposed to going up through Mall Holland. And Hillel was way too religious, because it was orthodox. So no one was going to send their kids there. So when you spend that amount of money to send your kids there, you also get membership. So people started going. That explains it. And then slowly, slowly. And then Rabbi Wolfie came, and everyone was just in love with Rabbi Wolfie. 
I mean, he addresses these issues all the time. Half of his sermons are dealing with gossip, the Persian community, and he's, and the thing is, people love him so much that no one even gets offended when he gives them a good ass living in our community, because they need it. So I think that's how it started. And then it just became kind of a prestige thing. But my generation grew up singing Ashkenazi tunes. Um, we grew up, you go to the Sephardic, my dad loves going to the Sephardic temple, but I can't sing along with it, because it's only the Chazan. Right, that's what's so, right. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just become what everyone's grew And up that being in. said, my, we, we live in Westwood, so my kids have always gone to public schools with a lot of...